Okay, so some exceptions to Mendel. These are things that, that really would have confused Mendel. Mendel, either by luck or by purpose, uh, chose traits that were very easy to understand. Um, there's genetics that's way more complicated than what he was understanding, which was simple dominance. In other words, this allele's dominant over that allele, right? There's stuff that's way more complex than that, okay? So um, things like this cat would have completely messed him up. It would have been really hard for him to figure out what was going on there, right? And we only understand this now because of our modern understanding of DNA. We can kind of put the whole picture together. So we'll come back to this cat here in the end. Um, but just as a refresher, here's the kind of stuff Mendel was looking at. Mendel was looking at whether he, every, for every characteristic he looked at in his peas, there were two possibilities. So a pea could either be inflated pod or constricted pod. A pea could either be a yellow pod or a green pod. Flowers could be axial or terminal. The plants themselves could be tall or they could be dwarfs. The flowers were either purple or white. The seeds were either smooth or wrinkled. They were either green or yellow. There wasn't a third possibility or a fourth possibility or a fifth possibility. In other types of genetics, there are. Okay, so it makes the Punnett squares maybe a little more complex sometimes, and it would have really screwed up his accounting of the simple math. So oftentimes in science, we're trying to sort something out. We don't start with the most complicated version of something to figure out how it works. We try to find the simplest possible situation and sort that out, which I'm, I'm assuming is exactly what Mendel did and why he chose pea, pea plants, because he knew there was only two possibilities. He wanted to know how does it end up, this one or that one. Okay, so uh, let's start here with the first. We're going to go through a number of these different types of more advanced genetics. The first one is called incomplete dominance, and it is just what it says it is. One allele, um, either allele is neither completely dominant over the other. So no matter what, they both get expressed. Okay, remember before, uh-oh, <laughs> what just happened here? We just lost all power. There we go, coming back. Not sure what's going on there. Our projector's kind of freaking out a little bit. So uh, neither allele is completely dominant. Okay, they, 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 they both are, okay? So what, what's going to happen here is a blending of the alleles, okay? So if we've got in this situation We've got two plants we're going to cross. We've got a red one, a red flower, and a white flower. Okay, the alleles look like this. The genotypes are down, written down below them. So this is a different type of notation you're going to kind of have to get used to. Instead of just big and little alleles, now we have alleles with superscripts, and those can be big or little. Okay, so if you look up here under the red plant, you've got big C with an R up there, a big R. Then you've got big C with a big R. So the C, I'm assuming this is probably stands for color, and the R is telling us red or white. Okay, this, this, but it doesn't have to do that. Like, we just pick a letter, because sometimes using things like W is really bad, because it's hard to tell if it's a capital or a, or a lower case. So it just, we just pick a letter, but oftentimes they kind of represent. So in the white flower, it's CW, CW. Okay, so... Um, you could also represent this same thing without the C's, just using big R's and big W's. But they'd all be capitalized because they both get expressed. It's like, it's like they're incompletely dominant over each other. So one never hides, if you will. So if we, if we go ahead and mate these two, you can recognize that we don't have to draw the Punnett square. All the babies would be big C, R, big C, W. Okay? And it turns out that all the babies end up pink. So they're a blend of both the parents. That would have been really hard to figure out for Mendel what was going on there, right? If we cross two of these pink babies, okay, the way we would do the cross is just right down here. You're going to have to do some of these today, so kind of make sense of it. One of them, one of the parents, maybe the, ones, the male, the, the sperm, is going to be C big R and C big W. So we spread those alleles out. See how we, we separate them out on the Punnett square? And then the other one is going to be exactly the same, right? Because these are, these are hybrids here. The F1s are hybrids. So now we do the Punnett square. And do you see how we put it together? C big R, C big R, that's going to be a red flower, OK? C big R, C big W, that's going to be a pink one. So let's talk for a second about why, like what's actually going on. 
in terms of these flowers, one of the things that can happen is you've got this gene, okay, that codes for a protein. And that protein is a certain shape, and it makes red, red color, okay, red pigment. So if you've got the gene that makes this red pigment, that big R, you're going to be a red flower. Okay? If you've got two of those genes, because you've got one big R from dad and one big R from mom, you're going to have some very vibrant, like you're going to produce a lot of red color, right? Because you've got two, two of them. You get one from mom, one from dad. But what if mom gave you a big R, so you're, you're going to produce red, but dad gave you a, a big W, which means you're going to produce white. You're going to get a mix of those two. One's not going to cover up the other. But what's really happening in this situation genetically is that there's a gene out there for color in these plants that's broken. In other words, it, it doesn't work to produce a pigment. So if you produce red pigment, but not as much red pigment, that looks pink. You get it? If you get two of these W genes, you don't produce any pigment at all. So you just look white. So that can be one, there's lots of ways this can kind of play out genetically, but that might be what's happening here with the flowers, okay? So does everybody, that kind of make sense to you guys? So you take two and they both kind of mix and you get a mixed color if you're a hybrid. If you're CRCW, you're pink. That's incomplete dominance. It's a little bit confusing when you compare it to this. This is similar in a lot of ways. This is called co-dominance, okay? So each allele, they don't just kind of each express a little, they completely express. So instead of some blended cow, we're going to end up with cows here that are speckled. In certain parts of the cow, one gene's going to express, and in other parts of the cow, the other gene's going to express. Okay? This is a famous situation in what are called roan cattle. So uh, you start with a white one and a brown one. What do you call that? I guess you call it brownish, brown cow. And you end up with a brown and white speckled cow. So if you see speckles rather than blending, guaranteed codominance. Okay. So how do we write this? Uh, so look at the Punnett square there. If this cow is big R, big R, see we didn't use the superscripts this time, you could. And this cow is big W, big W, well all their babies are going to be big R, big W. Which means that every single one of their babies is going to be roan. If we cross two of the rones, we're going to get a mixture of different things. Some of them will be, some of them will be white, some of them will be uh, brown, right? And some will be roan. Okay, so that's codominance. Did I lose anybody yet? Those are the two easier ones. Okay. Here's another codominance, checkered chickens, another famous example. You cross a white one and a black one, expecting you'll either get white or black, but instead you get checkered. So in some parts of the bird, the white gene expresses, and in some parts of the bird, the black gene expresses. So you do this cross kind of like this. Or you could even write little subscripts, like you could like a C with a big W. But you gotta look at what's happening. Both of those genes that get expressed, this is why we capitalize them to make them dominant. So all the babies turned out checkered. If we cross two checkered babies, we're gonna get some that'll come up white, some will come up black, and some will come up checkered, right, in some proportions. Cool. Here's the difference, if you're looking at, let's say we've got two flowers, and you're like, which one's co-dominant, which one's incomplete dominant? Well, the one on the left here, if, if we cross a red one and a white one, and it came out pink, that would be an example of incomplete dominance. But what if we crossed a white one and red one, and we ended up with red and white splotches? That would be co-dominance. Okay, it's really easy to see when you get the results. See, sometimes you're just gonna have a Punnett square, and you're gonna have to kind of sort it out, and wonder what happened. Okay, let's talk about multiple alleles. This is another type. So we've got incomplete, we've got codominance, and then we have multiple allelic traits. Most humans have more than two versions um, of alleles. Okay, so a lot of our characteristics, which is hard to look at humans and sort out, like you're wondering, am I big T or little t for hair color? Am I big T or little t for height? Well, well neither. There's many different alleles that code for that. It's not simple like Mendel's pea plants. Okay, so this a famous example of multiple alleles as well as codominance is blood types. Does anybody know their blood type? Maybe, I don't know. It's not a bad thing to know. So uh, you've probably heard you can be type A, type B, type AB, and type O. 
Okay, you're one of those com combinations right there. So how do you get that? Well, um, if you look at the left table over here, it's showing you some different genotypes, okay? So blood type A, there are actually two different genotypes that can give you blood type A, okay? Um, this immunoglobin factor here, I, is, is gonna have a big A, or it's gonna have none, or it's gonna have a B on it, okay? So if you've got big A, big A, you're gonna be type A, okay? If you've got big A and then nothing on the big A, that recessive one there, you're going to still be type A. So there's two ways you can be type A. Okay. Um, if you're looking at B, there's also two ways you could be type B. You could be IB, I, IB, IB. Both of those would give you B. But there's only one way you can end up here with type AB and that's to have both the A and the B. There's also only one way you can end up with type O, and that's to have neither of those um, two uh, A and B genotypes, okay? So if you look at the picture over there, what's really going on is those things code for surface proteins on your blood. So type O blood doesn't have any surface proteins on it. Type AB has both types on there, Type B has only one type, and type A has only one type. So what happens if you get a blood transfusion because you're in the hospital, and they give you type B blood and your type A blood? Those things clot and combine, and then you die. It's a big problem, right? What if they give you type, um, if, they give, uh, if they give you type O blood, right, it doesn't have any surface antigens on it, so you can have type O blood. That's why O is the universal donor, because it doesn't have any of those on it. Um, AB uh, can have either because AB has both proteins on it, so they're not going to trigger any kind of response. See? So that's why they want to know when they want to blood type you when you go to the hospital, okay, because of that sort of thing. But do you see how that's a, that's a multiple allelic sort of thing? There's more than one allele involved. In other words, these things are on, um, they're on the same gene, but there's three different versions of the gene. There's not a version of the gene that's tall and short, there's a version of the gene that's A, B, and neither. And those are circulating around in the human population. Okay? So there's multiple genes here. You could get, you're going to get one from mom, one from dad. You'll get an A, a B, or an O from either parent. One of those. But there's three, ch three possibilities, not just two, which is what we've normally been doing. Okay? And, and they're, they're co-dominant, so they both can express like checkered chickens, right? If you, get type, if you get type A and type B, your AB both get expressed. Okay, I know, I can't believe it that one, but it's gonna come back again. Does that kind of make sense to you guys? Okay, that's multiple allelic. Let's talk polygenic. Polygenic's really similar to multiple allelic. The, the big difference is that there's multiple genes involved and they're not on the same chromosome. They're kind of all over the place. Okay. Skin color, hair color, eye color are really good examples of that in humans. What happens is you have a whole bunch of genes that contribute to this, and depending on which version, which allele of those genes you get, um, your, your skin is this range of colors. Your hair is this range of colors. So um, what we see when it's a polygenic trait okay, is, is not an expression of one of three different genes, but an expression of all of those genes in this continuum pattern. So there's like every shade imaginable, okay, in, in terms of this, which is why there's so much variation, which is also why these particular traits are evolutionarily very, very useful. They help us in many ways, having polygenic traits. Because let's say there's a new disease, right? If you produce um, antigens to that disease, right, uh, to, to fight it, if there's this huge range that you can produce, uh, you could be better protected, right? So that's why these things are, are really evolutionarily pretty fantastic genes. Uh, but a lot of different things are controlled by this. Let's look at an example here, one I just gave you. So let's say there's three different genes, okay? Gene one, gene two, and gene three, and they all code for um, skin color, okay? There's, I, there might actually be more than that. Actually, I think there are three. No, there's got to be more than that. Um, 
We're just looking at three here though, okay? So they can be dominant or recessive in this case. They could be big D, big, little d, little d, little d, big d, little d, big d, right? They could be every variation of this, but you inherit three different ones. So dad's gonna give you um, three different d's. Mom's gonna give you three different d's. And the combination of all of those determines your skin color. So check it out, what we do with skin colors, we're gonna count up the number of recessives total in the, in the child and the dominance in the child. And if you have all recessives, six recessives, and zero uh, dominance, you are like an albino. You're very, very white, okay? As opposed to like if you had three dominant letters there and three recessive letters, you'd be kind of in the middle of the spectrum. Okay? If you're on the other end of the spectrum, you have more dark ones than you have light ones. These are actually the genes that code for pigment, melanin in your skin. So that's, that's the only difference here. Right? But you can see why there's so much variation. But we can look at this graph and you're gonna have to one of the activities. Look at this gigantic Punnett square here. Okay? Look at all the different combinations that they're doing here. It's multiple allelic and there's three different genes that are involved, or sorry, polygenic, and there's three different genes that are involved. Let's look at the graph over here. Look at the distribution curve. Do you see how in the middle, that average there, that's the most common. So if you get asked on a question, which one's the most common phenotype, it's whatever color is in the middle there. If you ask what are, what's the most common genotype, look, look at the genes that are listed there. It's the one in the middle, right? Does it make sense? It's like there's an average. Okay, so let's say we cross um, purebred red cattle with purebred white cattle and their offspring fully express both traits, which exception to Mendel um, would that be? Does anybody know which exception that would be? Mm -hmm. Would that be um, multiple allele? Would it be codominance? Would it be, yeah, it would be codominance. Very good. That would be codominance. Oops, I think I've got the whole question up here. There we go. Codominance. Very good. Okay. Since both are dominant, you get speckles. If it was incomplete dominance, we'd get a blend. What do you get when you mix red and white? I guess you get pink cows. Okay. <laughs> See how you can tell what it is? If it, was, if, it was, if it was polygenic, there'd be this whole range of different colors that you could get, okay? If it was multiple allelic, there might be like three or four or more different versions that you could get. Okay, let's talk about something called epistasis. So by and large, the three we just did are the main ones you're gonna get asked about on the test and things. They're the, main, they're the main ones we want you to understand. We're gonna get into more weird, complicated stuff now, okay? Like, how do we get these three different colors here? Right? So what's going on here in labs is that there's a black coat color which is dominant to chocolate. But if the dog happens to inherit a double recessive epistatic gene, it's gonna turn yellow, regardless of what else it has. So sometimes there's genes that adjust the other genes. If you get certain genes, you're gonna have one thing, but if you happen to get this other one, it's gonna change everything. Red hair color is one of those, kind of similar to that in humans. Okay, so in the in the case of these dogs, uh, if you get if you get this double recessive little EE gene, you're going to be yellow. No matter what else you got, if you got big B, big B, little B, little B, doesn't matter. If you happen to get little E, little E anywhere in there, yellow. Okay, that's what an epistatic. So that just kind of means like one gene adjusting the function of other genes. So this next one, pleiotropy, pleiotropy, is where one gene affects more than one trait. If we look at these Siamese cats, there's a gene that provides the distinct coat color, but also makes their eyes crossed. So look at, look at its eyes. Its eyes kind of point inwards, okay? Um, and its coat, is similar to, it always looks like this. So if they get this coat shape, they, they're gonna get these eyes. It's kinda cool. So some genes are like that. 
we also have genes called lethal genes, where if you inherit the gene, you die. Pretty interesting, isn't it? So in the case of uh, these mice here, um, they could be dominant or recessive, okay? But um, most of them are, are typically dominant. So let's see here, if we've got, we've got a parent generation of yellow mice, they've got their hybrids, their big Y, little y, big Y, little y, okay? And they, of course, we can split up their gametes. This one can give a big Y or a little y, so can the other one. Okay. When they make the babies, if we were to make a Punnett square, okay, some of them are gonna be big Y, yellow Y, which is gonna be yellow, because yellow's dominant. Some of them are gonna be uh, little Y, little Y, which is uh, white, whatever that is, whatever non-yellow is. But if they get big Y, big Y, they die. They don't ever survive. Interesting, isn't it? So somehow that little Y gene is really important. And if they don't get it somehow, uh, they die. But the big Y gene still persists in the population. It's still around. Isn't that interesting? So, so there are genes that will kill an individual. In this case, um, if you've got two dominants and you're, what, what color would this mouse's fur be right here if it survived? Big Y, big Y. It would be yellow. Right, it would be yellow, it's yellow and dead. Right? You could be yellow if you're big Y, little Y and survive. But if you don't get that little Y, you're done. There's a bunch of different genes like that, okay? Um, yeah, I just said that right there. Yellow fur in mice is lethal for homozygous dominant individuals. If you're big, big Y, it's over. Should have leave that out there. So, uh, in the Manx cat, which is a tailless cat, okay, there are actually no homozygous dominant for tailless. Because if you get that scenario of genotype, you don't survive. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> You'd have to be heterozygous um, to get that. You couldn't get homozygous dominant because you don't survive. So we know what the genotype is of all those tailless cats. <laughs> all right, let's look, talk, look at another one here. These are called um, extremites. So what's going on here with these individuals? So the tips of some of their body parts are a different color than the rest of the body. So that's, a, that's something that you can notice. These are sometimes called environmental genes. So uh, there's genes that are actually affected by the environment. And one way to kind of notice that is it's the tips of the body on the creature. So what's going on here? Well, what's happening is that these genes are triggered, they're turned on or off based on temperature. So if it's, if it's warm out, the, the enzyme in these cats is inactivated that produces the, the color. So white is what you get when you don't produce a color. But in the external parts, like the ears, the nose, the feet, where it's colder, the, the, the animal's colder, the color gets produced, the gene's turned on. How strange is that? So you could like stick your bunny rabbit in the freezer and take it out an hour later, have black bunny rabbit. <laughs> no, don't do that. You'd have a dead bunny rabbit, right? But they do, like if it gets colder, their ex extremities that don't stay warm, they change color because their body starts producing those genes. Isn't that interesting? And there's been experiments done like this one where you can strap a cold pack to the back of a bunny. And then I don't know how long this takes. Like you gotta leave it on there for a couple of weeks or so. I don't know, you gotta keep changing it out. But eventually uh, black or dark fur, brown fur, whatever color that is there will form in a patch on the back. You could give your bunny like a, a hair tattoo just by strapping like cold things to its back. It's kind of neat, isn't it? Here's a cat, same thing, right? The colder parts of the cat, the ears, the nose, the tail there, they all produce that dark pigment. It's kind of cool. Um, so humans, here's a before and after in humans, uh, produce more melanin, which is pigment, when we're exposed to UV radiation. Which exception to Mendel would that be? Hmm? Which exception to Mendel would that be? We just talked about it. Biotropy. Oops, sorry. 
environmental, I meant to say, environmental alleles there. <laughs> so that's the environmental stuff that um, is causing this. We're, we're being uh, adjusted environmentally, okay, because of this. All right, we're going to talk here really quick about our chromosomes. We've been talking about the DNA. The DNA is in the chromosomes, um, and the chromosomes are those things that we've been looking at that look like X's. Okay, you get one from mom and one from dad for every pair that you have. Humans have 23 sets of chromosomes, and there's loads of genes on each of those. Some of them don't do anything. Some of them are really, really important. Um, if we look here, look at all these sets here, the very last set of our chromosomes in humans is what we refer to as the X and Y chromosomes. And I probably bet you've heard that. An X and Y would be what, a boy or a girl? If you get a Y chromosome, you're a boy. If you get two X chromosomes, you're a girl. That's female and male in humans, okay? Now, if genes are on the same chromosome, like say, I don't know, chromosome 16, let's say there's two genes that are really close to each other on that same chromosome, we can refer to them as linked. And linked genes tend to get passed together. So blonde hair and blue eyes, like I have, those are linked genes. If you've got blonde hair, it's very unlikely you're gonna have any other color eye than, than blue because they're really close together on the chromosomes. So when they get inherited, it's like if you get one, you just always get the other. So let's kind of see how that sort of plays out, okay? So um, looking at the genes here, if we're looking at a set of chromosomes, these are their sister chromatids here, during this process called crossing over, which happens during meiosis. So we've been talking about mitosis, which is regular old cell division, right? Nuclear division, the cell grows bigger, the DNA gets copied, it divides. Well, meiosis is what has to happen to make sperm and eggs. You've got to divide your cells and divide them again because you want half the DNA because you're going to give half in the sperm and half in the egg. Okay, so during meiosis, something occurs called crossing over, which further shuffles the DNA. So why sexual reproduction? Because it mixes up the DNA, right? Mom gives you half, dad gives you half. You're getting a mixed bag. And that gives us variation, which protects us against diseases and does all kinds of stuff. Makes variation in the population. Well, what if you could not only just get some from dad and some from mom, but when dad was making his sperm, he took his genes and then shuffled them around like a deck of cards, and mom did the same thing. So now we've got a real big mix, and that's what's called crossing over. So when they're making these sex cells, little bits of the chromatids here can flip-flop places. They can bust off and swap places. So if there happens to be blonde hair and blue eyes on the same little chunk of chromosome, they're always getting shifted together. They're not going to get misshuffled. Not very often. Okay, that's why certain characteristics always go together. So let's look at that in fruit flies. Okay, the genes for body color and wing shape are really similar, uh, really close on the same chromosome. So that's why you always get them together. So if you happen to have uh, a gray body, you're going to always get normal wings most of the time. Okay. If you happen to have a black body, you're almost always going to get these reduced little tiny little wings because they're close together on the chromosome. So if you work this out per Mendel, you would expect uh, a totally different ratio of genotypes and phenotypes than you actually get. And so it's like obvious something else is going on here. So they don't really work out to a, a, a typical Punnett square if you were to work it out because they always just get passed together. There's more of a chance you're going to inherit them because they're really close on the chromosomes. Okay, let's look at those chromosomes. Here's an actual picture of some. So if we take all the chromosomes in a human cell and we spread them out, we get something that looks like this. And this right here, if you look close, is a male or female, the last set there. That's a male, right? Okay, if we look at a female, this is what the female has. The female doesn't have a Y chromosome, They've got two X chromosomes, which this situation can lead to some really weird characteristic or really weird genetics happening. When things are, when certain characteristics are on these chromosomes, because these do more than just determine what sex you are, um, they can become more prevalent in a population. So for instance here, um, 
here's the x and this is how we draw them x and x for female x and y i know it kind of looks like a y without a tail but that's what it looks like okay um when we when we work this out as a punnett square dad is always going to give xy mom is always going to give xx so what percent of the babies are going to be females 50. what percent of the babies are going to be males 50. Always. That's why there's a 50-50 chance every time you roll the dice, whether it be male or female. And I bet you know families that have like all uh, female children or all male children, right? But every time they make another baby, there's still a 50-50 chance. Okay, it's not like there's a better chance it's going to be a boy because they had all girls last time. It's still a 50-50 shake of the dice, flip of the coin, if you will. Okay. Now, what happens if there's something on one of those genes? What happens is we call those specific genes sex-linked traits. So if there's something on one of these chromosomes, these X or these Ys, they're called sex-linked because you're going to get it different proportions if you're male or female. Okay. So most of the sex-linked traits that we're going to talk about in here are what we call X-linked. They're not on the Y chromosome. They're only on the X chromosome. Okay. That's why they're called X-linked. So if you've got a Y over here, you don't have that gene. So, so think about this like this, okay? If this gene codes for something maybe that you need, okay, for a boy, a boy has one copy of it. It's miss, the boy is missing the other copy. It's totally fine as long as he's got that copy. But what if the X that that boy inherited doesn't have the right version of that gene on it? All of a sudden, the boy's got that condition. What about in the case of a girl? If one of her exes doesn't have that, but the other ex does, she's okay. She would have to have both exes with the goof up on them for her to have the condition. So X-linked traits, X-linked traits, show up way more often in boys than they do in girls. Okay, Because boys have only one chance to avoid it. Girls have two chances to avoid it. That's how an X-link trait works. There are Y-link traits too, but we're not going to talk about them because it gets more confusing. So, check this out. Can anybody not see the numbers there? Having trouble? Are you colorblind? Yeah, usually we get at least one or two every, every uh, I'll get one or two out of all my classes today. Maybe some, some of you don't know if you're colorblind or not. I'm showing you for the first time. There are numbers there. That says 25, 45, 6, and 8. If you're colorblind, you can't see those. Colorblindness is an X-linked trait, which happens to appear more often in boys. Because you only have one chance to avoid it, girls have two chances. So mom could have the colorblindness gene and be totally fine. Okay. Um, dad uh, could not have the colorblindness gene at all. But dad's going to give you a Y if you're a boy. If mom happens to give you that colorblindness gene, uh, you're colorblind. You got it from mom. Here's another one. 56 and 29. Here's another one. 40. I guess it's 48. Sorry. Maybe I'm colorblind. <laughs> so here's how it works out on a Punnett square. We, we put the X's and the Y's. So uh, over here is dad, XY. And over here on top is mom, XX. Okay. They also have these superscripts here. The capital B right there equals normal. See how they put that over there? The uh, lowercase b is recessive for colorblind. It's a little b. So mom, check it out, mom is a carrier. She's got that little b on one of her X chromosomes. Dad can only give, if it's a boy, dad's only going to give a Y. Dad's going to give a, a good normal gene if he makes a girl. So if you look at the Punnett square, all of the girl babies are fine. Okay, one's a carrier. Of the boy babies, okay, you've got one boy that's fine and one boy that's got colorblindness. So it's going to be 50 50 every time in this scenario. For if you have a boy, 50% of the boys are going to be colorblind, 50% of them aren't. If you have a girl, 50% of them are going to be uh, normal in both of their genes. In 50% in, in 50 of them are going to be a carrier, but none of them will be colorblind. Pretty neat, huh? It's pretty neat. So um, the only way you could have a colorblind female 
child would be if dad was colorblind and mom was a carrier or colorblind herself. It's the only way it would work. That's why it's more rare in, in females. So uh, when you're looking at some of these uh, Punnett squares and, and characteristics and um, things, sometimes we'll, we'll show them uh, in terms of like whether they're affected or unaffected or a carrier by half shading in a little box, okay? Here is an example of that, okay? So let, let's work through um, this inheritance here by looking at the different uh, males and females. So in this, you almost always the circles are females and the squares are, are males. So we've got original parents up here, square in a circle, and the circle is a carrier. See that? The male doesn't have it. You drop down to their babies. These are all their babies in the next generation here. And they've got some carrier females and a boy that's got it. If you start to see this situation where they keep reproducing here, and the boys have it more often than the females do, and there's a lot of female carriers, almost it's a dead ringer that that's an X-linked, sex-linked trait. Okay, it's almost a dead ringer that that's what that is. Okay, hopefully that kind of made some sense to you guys there. So lastly, let's talk about this uh, just for the heck of it because it's weird. So calico cats happen from a real crazy combination of codominance, epistasis, and X-linked traits. There's like all kinds of madness going on to give you this weirdo looking cat, okay? So sometimes it is very, very complex. And I'll just walk you through it really quick just for the heck of it. So in cats, black fur and orange fur are codominant, but they're also both located on the X chromosome. So a male can only inherit orange or black fur. So they're only on the X chromosome. If you're a male, you either got the X big B or the X little B. And you're gonna be either orange or black, okay? Females inherit two X chromosomes, so they've got an XX, so you'd think they'd have two chances here, okay? But one X chromosome happens to in inactivate through a weird process that occurs, and you see it get all weird here. So it's kind of taken out of the picture. So no matter what, the cat, if the cat is homozygous, it's going to be whichever color it happens to inherit. It's gonna be, if it's homozygous, it's gonna be um, X, if it's a little b, it's going to be black. If it's a big b, it's going to be um, orange. Is that what we said? I think that's what we said. However, if the cat is heterozygous, x big b, x little b, those patches of fur where the orange allele inactivates will be black, and those where the black one inactivates are going to be orange. So this is not a whole body process. Every single, every single area has its own genes in the body of the cat. And if different ones activate and different ones inactivate, you end up with all this crazy speckled pattern. Isn't that weird? That is some complicated stuff, isn't it? It's pretty interesting how that all works out. Okay, so go ahead and uh, open up your quiz there. I'm going to take a look at that. Let me close this out.